Welcome everyone. I frequently, very frequently get asked questions both on my Instagram and my YouTube platform about products that are safe during pregnancy. And so I thought I would address this topic today and I have designed this video in such a way that I'll explain to you the rationale of the different categories of recommendations. In other words, never use, use with caution or perfectly safe. And then I will let you decide for yourself. Um, I think a lot of these decisions are hard for us because we don't know the foundation of how to approach the topic and how to make that decision. But as soon as you've got the tools to make that decision, it becomes easier to make. And at the end, I will share with you what I avoided during pregnancy. And I was super, super paranoid. So if you're interested in that, um, I'll save that for the end. Uh, please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And let's talk about pregnancy, safe skincare, and other things. I'm going to break up the recommendations into three categories. Absolutely contraindicated, we don't think so, and probably safe. And that's kind of the reality of where this sits. So number one is known to cause birth defects or teratogenic, which is the medical term for causing birth defects. Things like isotretinoin is known to cause birth defects, certain antibiotics. Excess alcohol we know causes fetal alcohol syndrome. So there are things we know that are very bad for fetal development. Category number two extrapolates information from category number one without knowing for sure. What I mean by that is because we know that isotretinoin, which is a type of vitamin A product, causes severe birth defects, we therefore don't recommend any retinols or tretinoin or um, adapalene tazeratine products. We don't know if it would be okay to use that throughout pregnancy. Maybe it would but maybe it wouldn't and nobody wants to find that out. So we just say better to wait, put that away until your pregnancy is over and then you can start using these products again. So this category includes all retinols and also hydroquinone. Retinols, as I mentioned, is because it's extrapolated from the toxicity of isotretinoin and hydroquinone is based on the knowledge that it has a very high absorption rate through the skin up to 30 to 40 percent. So we know that the hydroquinone will enter the circulation of the baby. Will it cause any harm? Nobody knows, but nobody wants to find out. So because of that and because, you know, hydroquinone is already such a controversial product to begin with um, because of the toxicity that's been shown when it was, you know, injected into uh, rodents, lab rodents at extremely high doses along with a whole bunch of other anecdotal research. Um, it's just better safe than sorry. And if you're interested in more information and the research and toxicity of hydroquinone, I do have a video uh, dedicated to that and I will link it in the description below. I said I was going to break this down into three categories, but actually it's going to be four. So the next category is we really don't know. There's no data to show that it's bad for you, but to keep it on the safe side, we suggest you don't use it or you use it in low doses. And an example of this would be salicylic acid. Some dermatologists think it's perfectly safe. Others worry because salicylic acid is a relative of aspirin and aspirin can be hepatotoxic or toxic to the liver, especially in children. So they don't advise against having that applied to the skin, although the chances of that absorbing into the skin and being in your circulation at a high enough concentration to impact the liver is not likely. That is the reasoning behind why some dermatologists stand against it. However, the 
American Board of Dermatology, I believe, uh, is okay with the salicylic acid being applied to the skin during pregnancy and the obstetric board as well. Next up, we have benzoyl peroxide. Again, this is controversial, although I don't actually really understand why. Um, I think here the thing to keep in mind is concentration. There's no reason to use a super high concentration. And the same with salicylic acid. Just if you choose to use it, maybe you want to use a slightly lower concentration. And then there's a whole other list that would fit into this category of we don't know, we don't do research on pregnant patients, and we have no idea. So I frequently get asked about specific products, let's say Skin Better Science products or Elastin products, and the only thing I can say is, well, alpha red is not recommended because it is a retinoid, but with many of the other products, I don't know for sure because it hasn't been studied. There's nothing to suggest that this will be harmful in any way, but you have to decide for yourself because we just don't have the research. Other things that would fall into this category for me would be chemical sunscreen. Now there are dermatologists that would absolutely disagree with me. The reason why I put uh, chemical sunscreen in this category is because oxybenzone maybe there's some evidence that it's a hormone disruptor and no reason to add any kind of hormonal disruption into your bloodstream while you're pregnant. That's just my opinion. Um, I don't like chemical sunscreens to begin with, but uh, there are plenty of dermatologists who say it's perfectly safe. Another one that really has no data would be a self-tanner. Uh, I would avoid it only because the skin is our largest organ. So if you're applying self-tanner, you're really applying a lot of the product on a lot of your skin but there's nothing to say that I'm right. Uh, again, it's that personal decision of you think about what you're doing, you think about where it's going, and then you decide what you're comfortable with. You may be comfortable applying it to your skin, and that's fine because there's no data to suggest that it shouldn't be. You just have to be okay with it. The one thing I would say is spray tanning is a different category because when you get a spray tan, you might inhale some of those chemicals and that becomes systemic. So you want to avoid breathing in any of those chemicals. Other questionable ingredients without research behind it because we don't study pregnant patients include tranexamic acid, kojic acid, licorice root, bakuchiol. There are so many uh, ingredients we use in skincare that we just don't know that those you have to decide how badly do you need them, how important are they to you in your skincare routine, and what risks you're comfortable taking. Azelaic acid is generally considered okay. And my fourth category is my, my personal rule is if it's okay to eat it, then it's okay to apply it to your skin. So here uh, we can get into benzoyl peroxide, which is a relative of benzoic acid. Benzoic acid is used to uh, bleach flour and we eat bread and pasta and it's not contraindicated during pregnancy. So why wouldn't it be okay to apply it to the skin? I would control the percentage and keep it at 5% or less but I see no harm in using a topical that's used for bleaching in food and also is present in nature. Benzoic acid is present in apricots and prunes and berries and uh, spices like cinnamon and cloves and allspice and coriander. So small amounts of this are just naturally found in food. So if you can ingest it, you're fine to apply to the skin. Another product that's exactly the same would be the alpha hydroxy acid family. Lactic acid uh, originates from fermented milk, yogurt, kefir, other alpha hydroxy acid derived from citrus fruit or tomato uh, are fine. If you can eat it, you can definitely apply it to the skin. You know, skin irritation is a separate issue, but it's not going to harm your baby. Uh, papaya enzymes, same thing. If you can eat a papaya, you can put a papaya enzyme on your skin. So that's my fourth category where you just use common sense. If you can eat it, you can definitely put it on your skin. I'd like to digress for one second into the realm of hormone disruptors. 
there are phytoestrogens and xenoestrogens that are considered hormone disruptors. And of those, the xenoestrogens are much more potent. But in terms of skincare, uh, if you want to minimize the hormone disruptors in your skincare, one thing to avoid would be artificial fragrance. A lot of fragrances use phthalates, uh, which are hormone disruptors. Also, as I mentioned, oxybenzone is questionable. It may be a hormone disruptor. It's also been shown to linger in the body for up to a week after application. So if you apply oxybenzone, your baby is going to have it circulating through its system for days. That doesn't mean it causes damage. There's no proof that it does, but you should know that that will be circulating through your baby for several days. So that and fragrance, and when it comes to the xenoestrogens, the thing to be weary of is BPA and BPA substitutes. So since BPA was recognized as toxic or unhealthy, um, its new substitute is shown to be just as unhealthy. Um, in 2019, researchers tied exposure to common hormone disrupting chemicals in consumer products during pregnancy to lower IQ in children by age seven. Interestingly, bisphenol, bisphenol F, a replacement chemical found in BPA-free plastics, was the most potent household chemical tied to lower child IQ. The pesticide chloropyrifos polyfluoroalkyl chemicals, the antibacterial chemical triclosan and phthalates found in vinyl plastics and personal products, personal care products also had IQ lowering effects. We also know that glyphosate, also known as Roundup, and its cousin, atrazine, which is the second most widely used herbicide in the US, um, are dangerous uh, endocrine disruptors. So things to be aware of in terms of diet, you may want to limit certain foods or opt for organic options. And the problem with atrazine when it's used as a pesticide is it ends up contaminating our drinking water. Now going back on track, as I promised, uh, I will tell you what I avoided during pregnancy. I didn't think too much about skincare, to be honest, but I had good skin and I didn't really use too many actives. Um, I never used chemical sunscreen, so that wasn't even a question, but I avoided nail polish, nail gel, any, any sort of uh, chemicals going on my nails. I didn't put any hair color or bleach on my hair. I avoided all mosquito repellents. I would use them. Uh, I would just spray my clothes or the blankets or chairs around me, but I wouldn't spray my skin. Even though there may be no data to support it, I didn't feel comfortable applying a mosquito repellent on my skin. What else didn't I do? I wrote it out because there were so many things I didn't do. Um, nail polish. I didn't wear perfume, uh, also because of the phthalates. Well, it wasn't because of the phthalates because I didn't know that, but intuitively I, just, I know that we no longer use essential oils for perfume. So again, I would apply it to my clothing and still till this day, I try not to apply perfume to my skin. I just apply it to my clothing and that's all I can remember. But the one last recommendation I will make is if you happen to be pregnant during flu season or in the fall, if you're thinking of getting the flu shot, uh, I want you to know that there is a multi-dose vial which contains thimerosal, which is a mercury-based uh, preservative. And there are vials that are single dose that do not contain this preservatives, as well as pre-filled syringes that do not contain this preservative either. So if you're pregnant or if you wanna give the shot to your children, I would just always inquire and make sure that you choose the product without the mercury in it because there is no way that that would be a healthy option. So that's my two cents on pregnancy skincare and more. I hope you found it helpful. If you have any additional questions, you know where to leave them. And I will see you guys in the next video.